So I don't always watch um, each video before shooting the next ver the next installment of it, but I certainly noticed my uh, my cough and clearing my throat all the time. I apologize for that. So I made uh, scratching my nose too. I uh, made some tea for myself. Hopefully that'll help. Hopefully that'll help this time. Um, I also noticed. Oh my goodness, my hair. I watched some of the feminist videos, and they have this little thing sticking up in the back, but anyway, um, enough, enough about my own vanity. In this video, I want to, I'm not sure how much I'll actually talk. I don't know why I'm shooting videos where I'm just reading things to you, but um, maybe it's important. Uh, important. I wanted to read some pages, early pages from Eve Sedgwick's essay, Queer and Now. I... It, I didn't ask you to read it for class, but I did pass have a handout that um, a handout of the pages that I'll be reading reading to you from. If any of you are interested in having your own copies of those pages, just let me know. I'll try to try to make a PDF of them and, and get it posted to Sakai. Um, but anyway, Sedgwick is one of my favorite theorists and and critics, not just in queer studies. Um, uh, because when she first started working, queer studies wasn't really a thing. Um, it wasn't, well, at least it wasn't called queer studies yet. Um, there's something about her literary criticism that I just find energizing and magnetizing. And, and in fact, in, in an ideal world, I would like to write the kind of criticism she writes. Um, I don't know if I'll ever be able to do it in in a professional setting, um, but be that as it may, I wanted to share with you something that's important to me, uh, uh, and that something important are these pages, um, which are related related to this unit. So don't worry, it's not just me um, living in perpetual discussion of my favorite books, although that is kind of what I do. Um, uh, I also just, you know, give overly long introductions to things I'm going to do. Anyway, uh, let me just read. Okay, so starting on page two of Tendencies, this is just sentences from the first passage I began this lecture series with. Okay. A section entitled Epistemologies. Epistemologies are ways of knowing things. Okay. Sedgwick writes, I've heard of many people who who claim they had assumed their children were dead as gay. What it took me, what it took me a long time to believe is that these people are saying no more than the truth. They even speak for others too delicate to use the cruel words. For there is all the evidence the preponderance of school systems, public and parochial, where teachers are fired routinely for so much as intimating the right to existence of queer people, desires, activities, children. The routine denial to sexually active adolescents, straight and gay, of the things they need, intelligible information, support and respect, condoms, to protect themselves from HIV transmission. As a policy aimed at punishing young gay people with death, this one is working. In San Francisco, for instance, as many as 34% of the gay men under 25 being tested and 50%, 54% of the young black gay men are now HIV infected. The systemic separation of children from queer adults, their systematic sequestration from the truth about the lives, cultures, and sustaining relations of adults they know who may be queer. The complicity of parents, of teachers, of clergy, even of the mental health professions in invalidating and hounding kids who show gender dissonant tastes, behavior, body language. In one survey, 26% of young gay men had been forced to leave home because of conflicts with parents over their sexual identity. I'll come back to that issue of identity later. In this video. Another report concludes that young gays and lesbians, many of them throwaways, comprise as many, a quarter of all, as many as a quarter of all homeless youth in the United States. 
an adult's systematic denial of these truths to ourselves. The statistics on the triple incidence of suicide among lesbian and gay adolescents come from a report prepared for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services in 1989. Under congressional pressure, recommendations based on this section of the report were never released. Under con congressional pressure in 1990, excuse me, 1991, a survey of adolescent sexually be sexual behavior is defunded. Under the threat, under the threat of congressional pressure, support for all research on sexuality suddenly in the fall of 1991 dries up. Seemingly, this society wants its children to know nothing, wants its queer children to conform, or, and this is not a figure of speech, die, and wants to know that it is getting what it wants. In this section, um, I'm going to pause for a second. In this section, um, this, just these two paragraphs, we see Sedgwick already um, anticipating, as it were, um, the passages from Edelman uh, that I talked about. Right? I mean, this this is the system she's talking about, right? Um, where you don't really have one puppet master running it all is nevertheless a system. Um, a system that is about maintaining, reproducing, and supporting uh, certain modes of living and denying, making invisible, marginalizing, um, and in some sense making sure that other modes of living will die off. Okay, next section. Promising, smuggling, reading, overreading is the title of this section. This history, the one Sedgwick has just talked about, makes its mark on what individually we, as those who do gay and lesbian work, or who do queer, we might say now, who do queer studies, on what individually we are and do. One set of effects turns up in the irreducible multi-layeredness and multi-phasedness of what queer survival means. Since being a survivor on this scene is a matter of surviving into threat, stigma, the spiraling, spiraling violence of gay and lesbian bashing, and in the AIDS emergency, the omnipresence of somatic fear and wrenching loss. It is also to have survived into a moment of unprecedented cultural richness, cohesion, and assertiveness for many gay, lesbian and gay adults. Survivors' guilt, survivors' glee, even survivors' responsibility. Powerfully as these are experienced, they are also more than complicated by how permeable the identity survivor must be to the undiminishing currents of risk, illness, mourning and defiance. Thus, she continues, I'm uncomfortable generalizing about people who do queer writing and teaching, even within literature. But some effects do seem widespread. I think many adults, and I am among them, are trying in our work to keep faith with the vividly remembered promises made to ourselves in childhood. Promises to make invisible possibilities and desires visible, to make the tacit things explicit, to smuggle, smuggle queer representation in where it must be smuggled, and with the relative freedom of adulthood, to challenge queer eradicating impulses frontally where they are to be so challenged. This helps, this will help set us up for our return to Mrs. Dalloway in the next video, right? Where we will, where I will, in some sense, be tasking us with attempting this very thing, smuggling in queer <clears throat> representation and queer energies into Mrs. Dalloway, where, I will argue, Wolf has made it possible for us to do so. 
Sedgwick continues, I think that for many of us in childhood, the ability to attach intently to a few cultural objects, objects of high or popular culture or both, whether they're novels or video games or what have you, objects whose meaning seemed mysterious, excessive, or oblique in relation to the codes most readily available to us, became a prime resource for survival. We needed for there to be sites where the meanings didn't line up tidily with each other, and we learned to invest those sites with fascination and love. This can't help coloring the adult relation to cultural texts and objects. This childhood fascination and attachment to objects, she, she is saying, can't help but color and affect how as adults, right, as a trained readers, we are approaching these same texts. In fact, she goes on to say, it's almost hard for me to imagine another way of coming to care enough about literature to give a lifetime to it. The demands on both the text and the reader from so intent an attachment can be multiple, even paradoxical. For me, she says, and this will mean a lot to us since we've talked about new criticism and formalism since the beginning of the semester. For me, Cedric writes, a kind of formalism, a visceral near identification with the writing I cared for at the level, not of content, but of sentence structure, metrical pattern, rhyme, was one way of trying to appropriate into her life what seemed the numinous and resistant power of the chosen objects. Education made it easy, she continues, to accumulate tools for this particular formalist project. Because the texts that magnetized me as a child happened to be novels and poems. It's impressed me deeply the way others of my generation and sense seem to have invented for themselves in the spontaneity of great need the tools for a formalist apprehension of other less prestigious, more ubiquitous kinds of text, genre movies, advertising, comic, comic strips, or even for others, something like fan fiction or professional wrestling. For me, she writes, this strong formalist investment in literature didn't imply, as formalism is generally taken to imply, an evacuation of interest from the passional, the imagistic, the ethical dimension of the texts. But quite the contrary. The need I brought to books and poems was hardly to be circumscribed, meaning to be kind of, you know, left out, right, of her reading of the texts. And I felt I knew I would have to struggle to wrest from them Sustaining news of the world, ideas, myself, and in various senses, my kind. The reading practice founded on such basic demands and intuitions had necessarily to run against the grain of the most patent available formulae for young people's reading and life, against the grain, often, of the most accessible voices, even in the texts themselves. We can sense here a resonance with the concerns of deconstruction, although Sedgwick, Sedgwick won't even allow herself to be circumscribed by that word either. Okay. At any rate, becoming a perverse reader was never a matter of my condescension to, te to texts. Right. Condescension from a position of mastery. Right. Rather, instead, becoming a perverse reader was a matter of the surplus charge of my trust in them to remain powerful, refractory, and exemplary. And this doesn't seem an unusual way for ardent reading, reading with love, to function in relation to queer experience. I want to let those sentences just kind of settle in, right? Because although Cedric is, is talking about herself and talking about others whom she admires, right? She's also talking about an orientation toward literature. An orientation that is kind of like formalism, right? In the sense that 
it's a, about an attention to the form of the text, right? To its structure, to its, to things that are implicit in the text itself, right? Or not immediately obvious. Um, but unlike formalism, it doesn't reject affect, doesn't reject what she calls the passional, the imagistic, the ethical dimensions of those texts. And in fact, maybe drawing from deconstruction, who knows? Um, in fact, what, she, what she's talking about is the way in which the texts that she learned to love as a child and love throughout her life, what she admires so much about them is that there's something in having a relationship to them you know, from her childhood into her, her adulthood, there was a kind of apprenticeship that happened. And along the way, she learned to occupy a relationship to literary texts that was a relationship marked by trust, a relationship that was not about mastery, but that was about accepting that those texts would continue to be teachers in a way, continue to be, as she calls them, powerful, refractory, exemplary, that they would continue to offer her nourishment, right? And that she, and offer her um, occasions, as she says in the same paragraph, to rest from the texts themselves, sustaining news of the world, ideas, myself, and in various senses, my kind. And that this mode of reading, she goes on to say, is perverse, right? In a transvalued, affirmative sense of the word, right? Subverting, right, what's obviously, what's obvious about a text, because one trusts the text to always have more to give. And in so doing, also subverting practices and modes of reading, practices and modes of living, right, that are normative, at the same time. Anyway, I'm going to sk skip the next section, though, though you can't see it, um, and move on to a section called Christmas effect, Effects. Right? This is important because um, at the end of the section, Sedgwick will come back around to what this word queer might mean, um, something we sort of began this lecture series with. Um, she'll, actually, that's the first question of the section. What's queer? Right? But she does, but what's important here is that she also is going to trouble and problematize how self-evident the term sexuality is for us, right? That it's, that when we start spending time thinking about what we mean by it, that it actually becomes far less coherent as an identity category, right? And, uh, that what's queer is, is precisely the sorts of things that we might find in the world, the sorts of spaces in which, spaces that sort of treasure the incoherence, the incoherence of those things. Okay, so uh, again, I'm talking too much. Let me just read. Um, what's queer? Here's one train of thought about it. The depressing thing about the Christmas season, isn't it? is that it's the time when all the institutions are speaking with one voice. The church says what the church says, but the state says the same thing. Maybe not. In some ways, it hardly matters in the language of theology, but in the language the state talks. Legal holidays, uh, long school hiatus, special postage stamps, and all. And the language of commerce more than chimes in as consumer purchasing is organized ever more narrowly around the final weeks of the calendar year, the Dow Jones a quiver over Americans' holiday mood. The media, in turn, falls in triumphantly behind the Christmas phalanx. Ad swollen magazines have oozing turkeys on the cover, while for the news industry, ever, uh, every question turns into the Christmas question. Will hostages be freed for Christmas? What did the flash flood or mass murder, umpty ump people killed and maimed, do to those families' Christmases? And meanwhile, the pairing families' Christmas becomes increasingly tautological, as families more and more constitute themselves according to the schedule, and in the endlessly iterated image of the holiday itself constituted in the image of 
the family. The thing hasn't finally so much to do with propaganda for Christmas, as with propaganda for, uh, excuse me, propaganda for Christianity, as with propaganda for Christmas itself. They all, religion, state, capital, ideology, domesticity, the discourses of power and legitimacy, line up with each other so neatly once a year. And the monolith so, cre so created is a thing one can come to view with unhappy eyes. What if instead there were a practice, a practice of valuing the ways in which meanings and institutions can be at loose ends with each other? What if the richest junctures weren't the ones where everything means the same thing? Think of that entity, the family, an impacted social space in which all of the following are, are meant to line up perfectly with each other. A surname, a sexual dyad, a legal unit based on state-regulated marriage, a circuit of blood relationships, a system of companionship and succor, a building, a proscenium between private and public, an economic unit of earning and taxation, the prime site of economic consumption, the prime site of cultural consumption, a mechanism to produce, care for, and acculturate children, a mechanism for acculturating material goods over several generations, a daily routine, a unit in a community of worship, a site of patriotic formation. It's 15 things. And of course, the list could go on. She ends the sentence. Looking at my own life, I see that probably like most people, I have valued and pursued these various elements of family identity to quite differing degrees. For example, no use at all for worship, much need of companionship. But what's been inconsistent in this particular life is an interest in not letting very many of these dimensions line up directly with each other at one time. I see it's been a ruling intuition for me that the most productive strategy intellectually, emotionally, might be, whenever possible, to disarticulate them from one another, to disengage them. The bonds of blood, of law, of habitation, of privacy, of companionship and succor from the lock step of their unanimity in the system called family. So you see in Cedric's way to kind of like change how we think of family, right? To subvert it and kind of unpack it and show that it's made up of all these other sort of loose and loose and dangling threads, right? Her point is not to kind of just reject all of it altogether, right? That's not, that's not a queer project for her, right? But rather a project of allowing some of these threads to be de-emphasized, others to be more emphasized, and, you know, kind of constructed and organized in other ways, right? That, for her, is something that queer might mean. Okay. She continues, Or think of all the elements that are condensed in the notion of sexual identity. Are you straight or gay? Right. Or now bi, if we're super progressive. Something that the common sense of our time presents as a unitary category. Right. You're either this or that, or this or that. Right. It's that simple. Right. Yet exerting any pressure at all on sexual identity, right, on this category, you see that its elements include your biological, for example, chromosomal self, sex, excuse me, male or female, your perceived gender, excuse me, gender assignment, male or female, supposed to be the same as your biological sense, sex, sorry, the preponderance of your traits of personality and appearance, masculine or feminine, supposed to correspond to your sex and gender, the biological sex of your preferred partner, the gender assignment of your preferred partner, supposed to be the same as his or her biological sex, the masculinity or femininity of your preferred partner, supposed to be the opposite of your own, your self-perception as gay or straight, supposed to correspond to whether your preferred partner is your sex or the opposite, your preferred partner's self-perception as gay or straight, supposed to be the same as yours. Your procreative choice, supposed to be yes if straight, no if gay. Your preferred sexual acts, supposed to be insertive if you are male or masculine, receptive if you are female or feminine. Your most eroticized sexual organs, 
supposed to be to correspond to the procreative capabilities of your sex and to your insertive receptive assignment. Your sexual fantasy is supposed to be highly congruent with your sexual practice, but stronger in intensity. Your main locus of emotional bonds supposed to reside in your preferred sexual partner. Your enjoyment of power in sexual relations supposed to be low if you are female or feminine, high if you are male or masculine. The people from whom you learn about your own sex, gender, and sex supposed to correspond to yourself in both respects. Your community of cultural and political identification supposed to correspond to your own identity. And again, she stops the sentence, many more. Even this list, she continues, is remarkable for the silent presumptions it has to make about a given person's sexuality, presumptions that are true only to varying degrees, and for many people, not true at all. That everyone has a sexuality, for instance, and that it is implicated with each person's sense of overall identity in similar ways. That each person's most characteristic erotic expression will be oriented toward another person and not autoerotic. That, that if it is alloerotic, it will be oriented toward a single partner or kind of partner at a time. That its orientation will not change over time. These are all assumptions um, that even her sort of subverted, sub, um, subverting list, right, of, of components of this simple category of sexual identity um, contains. All these assumptions would also complicate that uh, even more, right? This is heteronormativity, in other words, um, what will later be called heteronormativity, the way in which uh, heterosexuality or even homosexuality is... Um, is given through culture, through its institutions, through its structures of understanding, through its practical orientations, as somehow simple and coherent, right? That it's really about sexual desire and object to choice. And what Sedgwick is showing us here is that that again is just a construction, right? That really all that actually is going into that category is really complicated. And it's very possible that for each of us, some of these issues or some of these components actually don't line up as neatly as we think they should or as neatly as, um, as the system, as it were, um, suggests they should. Sedgwick continues, normatively, as the parenthetical prescriptions in the list above suggest, it should be possible to deduce anybody's entire set of specs from the initial datum of biological sex alone, if one adds only the normative assumption that the biological sex of your preferred partner will be the opposite of one's own. With or without that heterosexist assumption, though, what's striking is the number and difference of the dimensions that sexual, sexual identity is supposed to organize into a seamless and univocal whole. And if it doesn't? That's one of the things that queer can refer to. The open mesh of possibilities, gaps, overlaps, dissonances and resonances, laps and excesses of meaning when the constituent elements of anyone's gender, of anyone's sexuality, aren't made or can't be made to signify monolithically. The experimental linguistic, epistemological, representational, political adventures attaching to the very many of us who may at times be moved to describe ourselves as, among other possibilities, pushy femmes, radical fairies, fantasists, Drags, clones, leather folk, ladies in tuxedos, feminist women or feminist men, masturbators, bulldaggers, divas, snap queens, butch bottoms, storytellers, transsexuals, aunties, wannabes, lesbian identified men, or lesbians who sleep with men, or people able to relish, learn from, or identify with such. Again, queer can mean something different. A lot of the way I have used it so far in this dossier is to denote also simply same sex, sexual object, choice, lesbian or gay, whether or not it is organized around multiple crisscrossings of definitional lines. And given the historical and contemporary force of the prohibitions against every same sex sexual expression, for anyone to disavow those meanings or to displace them from the term's definitional center, would be to dematerialize any possibility of queerness itself. Okay, so I'm going to stop there. Apologize for reading to you for so long. I hope it's been nice listening to it. Sedgwick is such a 
smart and beautiful writer. Um, what we encounter at the end here, right, with her attempt to unpack and I'm just going to use the word to deconstruct categories like the family and sexual identity um, to show that there's all kind of space of freedom and movement within those um, categories. Um, so much space for difference and experimentation and mobility um, that we come back around to the two notions of queerness with which I began this lecture series. The notion that's about counter-normativity, about spaces of freedom, about resistances to guilt and shame, um, or about trans-evaluations of them, about sensuality, sexuality, sensuousness, um, and the history, right, of shaming, of illness, of death, um, of marginalization and oppression, um, that both of those senses of queerness um, are the two senses of queerness that Sedgwick or at least where I've stopped here, she continues for a few more paragraphs, the two senses she ends with here, right? wanting to maintain both of them together at the same time. What I want to suggest is that in this section, it's, in, it's important for me to end here, because I want to say that in some sense, what Sedgwick shows is that queer criticism, right, or queer theory, what it enables is a kind of unpacking of very familiar terms, an unpacking of, in literary texts, familiar tropes or familiar characters that we think we've really identified in one way or another, really interpreted in one way or another. And what it enables us to do, right, is to, as Sedgwick says, smuggle some queer energies um, or queer representation, as she says, uh, in another spot, into spaces and into categories and into texts and into novels um, where we initially didn't see it. And in the case of Wolf, as I hope to suggest in the last video, the next video, in the case of Wolf, I want to suggest that Wolf is actually inviting us to do that, right? Inviting us to do that. That just as she doesn't necessarily make the novel about the representation of authentic women's experience, but rather, in some sense, through the working through the textual practice of the novel, we see she's doing, um, it's not so much about directly representing it as it is about um, sort of performing um, one component of it or thinking about it, um, women's um, place in, in society in a very parochial and particular way that's still insightful and in its own way feminist. Likewise, Wolf is doing the same thing, kind of, um, when it comes to queer life, right? although Wolf might not have called it that. Um, and I want to demonstrate this not through a reading of Clarissa Dalloway, which is how Hafey does it, right? I would argue that that's one thing Hafey does, that um, the treatment of the way in which the kiss operates in the novel is one of the ways in which we might smuggle in queer representation and queer energy in a way that is resonant with the way Wolf has formed and ordered the actual novel. But it's not Clarissa I want to focus on. It's on somebody else in the novel. On her double. Okay, so we'll come back and, and talk about um, Septimus Smith. <laughs>